Okay, so for today, I'll take your um, I'll take your take home quizzes, and then hopefully get both sets graded by Friday. I'll post the answer key to it um, online. And I think I have to link up the last lecture video. So if you weren't here on Wednesday and look for it, it's somewhere in the Cultura cloud. But it's it'll be online. All right, so today the topic was side chain reactions of enzymes. Which basically means that when you have a side chain, when you have your side chain attached to the benzene ring, sometimes the reaction becomes a little bit different because of the influence of the benzene ring. But what this allows me to do then is ask you basically any question over the course of the year. Because all the side chain reactions of benzene are the reactions that we've hopefully learned from the beginning of last semester. But I just want to focus on one today. And that is, I want to start with this molecule and I want to add H plus H2O to it. Okay. So can you write the structure of the major product of that reaction? Actually, could you write the structure of both of the possible products of that reaction? Let's start with just the skeleton. There's my two possible products the skeletons of my two possible products. So somebody tell me, what am I doing in this reaction? And what? OH and H. So I'm adding an H and an OH. How? Okay, so where should the H go? Should the H go to A or should it go to B? Done? Either of them. Neither of those. That is correct. <laughs> When I do that, just say, are you sure that's what you want? You're correct. Neither of those. How about these two? Where should the H go? A or B? Mitch? So you want to add the H where? Okay, if I add the H to A, I get that product that I just wrote. Anybody want to add it to B? So I get that. So which one is it going to add to? Markovnikov's rule says it should add to the carbon with what? I hear more hydrogens. The more stable carbocation, we broadened it out. So which one is it going to be in this case? Well, the benzylic carbocation is going to come into play. We have to ask ourselves, is forming a carbocation at A, when I add the H plus to B, going to be more stable than adding H plus to A and forming the carbocation at B? So really, is a benzylic carbocation more stable than a tertiary carbocation? Right, that's the question. So that's the relevance to today's lecture material. Now I'm going to go on a tangent, a very concentrated tangent here, on how we're going to figure out what the major product is. 
or if we get a mixture of the two products, how do I know what the major product of this reaction is? And guess what it's going to involve? What? Spectroscopy. So it's relevant to today's lecture material. So I'm going to take your last five weeks of spectroscopy and I'm going to concentrate it into 50 minutes. So buckle up. All right, if, if I'm really doing this reaction, how do I know where the H, H plus and the OH added? Well, I do the reaction, I collect, I collect my product. I may take a TLC of it to see if I got one or two spots. I may shoot it into a gas chromatograph, see if I get one or two peaks. But ultimately, I have to characterize the one or two or both products that I get for the reaction. And so I'm going to use mass spec, IR, proton, and carbon. Okay, and what I'm going to show you is kind of the general way that I suggest we do this kind of problem. First thing I need is I need a molecular formula. Well, in this case, those two products have a molecular formula of C10H14O. But what if I didn't know that? Where does the molecular formula come from? The molecular formula comes from the mass spec. So if I take a sample and I inject it into a mass spectrometer, I will get the furthest peak to the, left, to the right, the highest mass peak, and it's actually a mass to charge peak, because only the charged ions move through the spectrometer. But in simple organic molecules, the charge is always one, so a mass to charge ratio is just the mass. If you ever do protein mass spectrometry, you can get charges of two and three, and then you've got to take that into account. But this is a charge of one, so this is the atomic, or it's the formula mass, or the molecular weight of the molecule. This right here is what we would call our M plus dot peak, right? All right, where did it go? You got the key. How did I get all the way down there? So that's our M dot plus peak. That's the molecular weight. And in this case, it weighs 150. What is this peak? Honestly, if you know, say something. If you don't, then I'm... this is called the this one's called the M plus one peak. That's the atomic, or that's the molecular weight plus one. Where does the plus one come from? Well, there's isotopes of carbon. There's carbon-13, there's carbon-12. 12. Carbon-12 12 is 98.9% of all carbon. 1.1% of the carbon in the world is carbon-13. That actually varies a little bit in the second and third decimal points. So this is the molecular, the molecular mass plus one carbon substituted with one carbon-13, just naturally. There's a one in a hundred chance that every one of those carbons is a carbon-13. So what you're seeing is, this is a molecule that has one carbon with a carbon-13. There's a little teeny tiny guy here at 152. That's when you've got two carbons with carbon-13. Well, one out of a hundred chance of this, one out of a hundred times one out of a hundred chance of that, that's one out of 10,000. This peak's gonna be really small. Okay, so that's the M plus one peak. You might say, who cares? You're gonna say that a lot. Well, I do, and that means you do. So that peak actually 
can tell us how many carbons are in the sample. Because if we figure that for every carbon there's a 1% chance of that being a carbon 13, if I divide that ratio, or if I take the ratio of this peak to this peak, it'll give me, when I divide through by 1.1, it'll give me the percentage, or it'll give me the number of carbons that are there. So for instance, if I look at this, I see this is about 10%. The, the mass peak set to 100 is 10%. So 10% of the samples have a carbon, one carbon 13. Well, how many carbons are there in this molecule? That I don't know right at the moment. I'm going to forget about the molecular formula. But if it's 10%, if I took 10 divided by 1.1, that's going to give me approximately the number of carbons in the sample. Now, actually, in this case, it's a little bit bigger than it's a little bit bigger than 10%. My guess is it's 11.1%. Okay. I don't have a molecular formula yet. All I did was isolate my molecule, put it in the mass spectrometer. Now I have a molecular weight, and now I have roughly how many carbons are in the sample. Everybody kind of with me so far? All right. If something doesn't make sense, you've got to yell. So then what I do is I go to, I go to a book. I didn't bring my old spectroscopy book from when I was an undergraduate. I looked at it, it was $31 at the time. Book prices have gone up considerably, as have tuition. So when I was an undergraduate, we had to take a special class called Spectroscopic Identification of Organic Molecules. It was separate from lecture, it was separate from lab, it was on nothing but spectroscopy. I got a C, because I had a hard time understanding what was going on. Ironically now, I can do NMR mass spec pseudo expert, or at least I can claim I am. So just because you get a C in something doesn't mean that you're forbidden from ever doing that again. And I'll blame the fact that we didn't we had crappy NMRs and it was just not easy to understand. But I didn't understand it. So we go to my book, and my book says, here's all the possible formulas that will add up to 150. And so I look through this and I could actually, this is the, this, these all weigh 150, here's the percentage of the M plus one peaks, here's the percentage of the M plus two peaks. There are mass spectrometers that can get you the mass of the molecule down to four decimal points. It's called exact mass spectrometry. So I can look at this table and I can figure out, well, what's the most likely formula that I got? And if I look through here, if I look in this 10 region, I see a C, I see C9s with nitrogens in them. It's relatively easy to tell if something has a nitrogen in it. This molecule doesn't. We know the product doesn't have nitrogen, right? We're doing this reaction, so we kind of have an idea of what the molecule is. So now I go to 11%, that's why I was saying it most likely is 11%, the mass plus one. I see C10H14, everything else has nitrogen. So I'm thinking the molecular formula is C10H14O. So if you were wondering, where does this molecular formula come from mysteriously? It actually comes from the mass spectrum and then looking at the possible formulas that give you that molecular weight. So that's where it comes from. And we're not doing this reaction in, somebody didn't just didn't walk up to me on the street and say, hey, here's a molecule, can you figure out what it is? No, actually that, ha that does happen from time to time. People do give me stuff and they say, can you figure out what it is? And I have no idea where it came from, and I have no idea what it is. So that's a little challenging. But in this case, it's the product of that reaction. So I kind of have an idea. But this is how I figure out what its molecular formula is. Mass spec, 
and then that gives me the formula. And what really helps me is that m plus 1 peak. That m plus 1 peak narrowed it down. You just get something that looks like this. You get C, C10 H14 out. But that's where it comes from. Okay, so then I go, I take an NMR of it, proton NMR. I go and I take a carbon-13 NMR of it, of the product, of the major product. And then the question becomes, what do we do with those? So here is, I'm going to walk through how we could figure out what the structure is by using all of those pieces of information. And then probably will be helpful somewhere else in the future. Um, I will just say that there is some spectroscopy on the ACS fine. So, I have molecular formula. What do I do with it? Well, what I do with my molecular formula is that I'm going to determine first what are called degrees of unsaturation. Did you talk about degrees of unsaturation in your... Okay, if you did or you didn't, here's what we do. From the molecular formula, I can tell how many rings and how many multiple bonds are in my sample. So what I can do is I can use this formula of C minus H over 2 plus 1. So I take the number of carbons, subtract the number of hydrogens divided by 2, and add 1, and that'll give me the degrees of unsaturation. <coughs> that'll give me the number of rings and multiple bonds. So a cyclohexane ring is 1 degree of unsaturation. A double bond is 1 degree of unsaturation. A triple bond is 2 degrees of unsaturation. A benzene ring with a ring and three double bonds is 4 degrees of unsaturation. So if all I know is the molecular formula, I can tell a lot about the structure by simply determining the degrees of unsaturation. So I do that calculation. What if you had a nitrogen in your molecule? Well, oxygens don't count, and nitrogens, if you have one nitrogen, subtract a hydrogen. And there's other there's things for sulfur and some other things in there. But nitrogens are the tough ones because they you, then you have an odd number of hydrogens, and you can't divide an odd number of hydrogens by two. So nitrogen, you subtract a hydrogen. Okay. So, first thing we do is determine degrees of unsaturation. My molecule was what? C10H14O. How many degrees of unsaturation are in that molecule? Four. Ten minus seven plus one, four. So I've got four degrees of unsaturation. Now, next bullet point you'll see is if you have four degrees of unsaturation, that's special. Look for a ring. Look for an aromatic ring. Could you have like two rings and two double bonds? <clears throat> you could have two rings and two double bonds. That could be the case. Now, in this case, we know we're starting with a benzene ring. Um, it depends on the context of the molecule. I would say that the molecules that you're probably given now, if you see four degrees, you're probably looking at a benzene ring. It's unlikely that you'll have multiple rings with multiple double bonds. But in life, you can't exclude that possibility. And you know what? If we think we have a benzene ring, I've got two other ways to get information that that's really the case. And we're going to work through that. Okay, So molecular formula is important from that standpoint. And that's where mass spec becomes important because it gets you the molecular formula. IR. You look at the IR, we're looking for the presence and absence of functional groups. I don't have the IR for either one of these molecules, but if I got a big broad peak at like 3,500, that would tell me it's an alcohol. 
Do I expect these molecules to be alcohols? Yes, because that's the two structures I drew. Peaks above 3,000, hydrogens attached to double bonds. Peaks below 3,000, alkanes. whoop -dee. whatever. Peaks below 3,000 are boring because most molecules are an alkane with things hung on them. So virtually everything's going to have peaks below 3,000. I would be, I would kind of, my eyes would perk up if I didn't see something below 3,000. Because then I'd be like, wait, there's no alkane in this. But for the most part, there's always alkanes. Peaks above 3,000, though, they tell me double bonds are aromatic rings. So if I did have the IR for this, I'd expect to see something above 3,000. Then after that, I look for carbonyls. I can't have carbonyls in this molecule. Well, I could, but I don't. If I did, I'd, I'd need an additional degree of unsaturation. And I started with benzene ring, so getting a degrees of unsaturation of four, I expect that benzene ring to still be there. But I expect an OH versus a carbonyl. Okay. So everybody kind of with me so far? Spectroscopy is all about complementary information. The mass spec is giving me something that the IR is not. Then I go to the carbon-13 NMR. You go, why do that next? Because in my world, carbon-13 and IR give me complementary information. First of all, what is the carbon-13 NMR? Well, it's when you're looking at the carbon-13s, the carbon-13 nucleus. So. If you're going to do NMR spectroscopy on an organic molecule, the two nuclei you want to look at are the two most abundant nuclei in an organic molecule, carbon and hydrogen. Do we want to look at oxygen? Oh, we'd love to look at oxygen, but the problem is oxygen-16 doesn't have an NMR because it's, even number of, it's an even number of protons and neutrons. So we'd have to look at the O17, which is really small. Carbon-12 has 6 and 6. So carbon-12 doesn't show up in the NMR. It doesn't have that phenomenon of being placed into a magnetic field and orienting with or against the field. Because it, it has equal numbers of protons and neutrons. So carbon-13, that nucleus has an uneven number. And so therefore, it actually will align with or against the big magnetic field. So I'm going to I'm going to look at the carbon 13 because I can determine the spectrum and it's the carbon skeleton. So it's useful that way. Here's a chart that I just pulled off the internet. I think you had to memorize this chart, right? And then people allegedly have forgotten it after they had to write down the numbers. But there's no sense in remembering something if you're not going to use it. So how do we use it? Well, if you see a carbon in the 200 region, it tells you you have a carbonyl. So if you think you got a carbonyl in the IR, the carbon-13 will tell you definitely what you do about it. That's going to be down in the 180 range, but 20 plus, plus or minus 20 on 200. If you got peaks between 120 and 140, that's where you would see ring carbons. Or you would see carbons that are double bonded. So again, if you think you have an aromatic ring, you should see peaks in this 120 to 140, 160 region. If you have carbons attached to oxygens, they're going to be anywhere from 60 or 70. If you've got Halogens, halogens are more or lower. They're probably 40, 50, 60. And the more you move to the right, the more your alkane is. So your CH3s are going to be the farthest peaks to the right. The closer a carbon gets to an electron withdrawing group, like oxygen, like nitrogen, like halogens, the more it gets pushed to the left. So you can use this chart to verify your IR 
knowledge. You think you got a carbonyl? This will tell you definitely. You think you got a benzene ring? This will tell you. If you don't see anything in the aromatic ring, then maybe you got two rings and two double bonds. So that's what the chart will tell you. The other thing that carbon-13 will tell you, so we look at the table of shifts, the chemical shift of the carbon tells you what kind it is and what functional groups are present. That matches up with the IR. The number of peaks tells you the total number of unique carbons in your sample. Okay. So the easiest way to do this is to look at the carbon-13 for this product. Here's the carbon-13 for the first product. I don't know what page it's on. It's just keep turning until you see this. Here's the carbon-13 NMR for one of the two products. I think it's, it's product A, right? OK, so when I'm looking at this molecule, when I'm looking at this chemical shift region for carbon-13, tell me, do I have a ring? Are there peaks? that are part of an aromatic ring? Yes, because there's peaks within 120 and 140. There's a peak at 80. What does that mean? That's carbon attached to an oxygen. Do we know we have that? Well, the two structures I wrote out, we have that in either case. Uh, down here, we just have our normal run-of-the-mill alkanes. And this peak at zero is the reference. That's PMS. If I would have, I would cut it out so you didn't see it. So that's not that's not in the sample. So I've got some alkanes. I've got a C attached to an O, and I got a benzene ring. Now, how many unique carbons are in the product? Well, each peak represents a unique carbon. I'm going to go back to an analogy for free radical halogenation. The number of unique carbons is the way that we kind of determine the number of possible products in free radical halogenation. So we can use that skill to determine how many unique carbons would be in the carbon-13 spectrum. So if I gave you that alkane, for free radical halogenation, how many unique products are possible from free radically halogenating that alkane? Four? We all in agreement that there's four? Anybody want another, another number? So we've got A, B, C, and D. If I was to take the carbon spectrum of that molecule, I would see four peaks in the carbon NMR. So the other useful thing we get out of the carbon NMR is how many unique carbons are in the sample. And that's important because that can give us symmetry. If I have an isopropyl group, the two methyl groups are the same, so they only, that's only one peak. In carbon NMR, there's no integration. You've got to do something special for integration. So peaks can have varying heights. That's, there's no rhyme, or, well, there is a rhyme or reason for that, but I'm not going to get into it. So small peaks are one carbon, and if they're bigger, they may or may not be two peaks. Well, I'm not concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is the number of unique carbons. So in this product, there should be one, two, three, four. There's four unique carbons in the benzene ring. And then five, six, and seven, there's seven overall. So from this spectrum, it tells me there's seven unique carbons. Now, let's look at the top molecule. Because basically what I'm doing is erasing the double bond and putting an H and an OH. So in this molecule, there is one, two, three, 
four unique carbons in the ring because of the symmetry. And then there's Then there's five, six, and seven. So in the original molecule, there's seven unique carbons. So in the product, there's going to be seven unique carbons. The two groups on the end are going to be equivalent to each other. If I replace the double bond with an H and an OH. Okay, so that's the two, those are the two things that you get from a carbon NMR. You get what kinds of carbons are they? What are they attached to? That goes along with IR. And then you get the total number of unique carbons. And that's important. Because if you draw a structure that you have like five unique carbons and your spectrum only has three, your structure is wrong. Everything's got to match up. Okay, so if you were like, uh, I'm going to ignore the carbon-13, you don't have to. It's got useful information. You just have to know what it is. Okay, so now we're down to proton NMR. So like for um, carbon NMR, is it like reliable to always count the number of unique carbons yes. in the reactive photon? Not, not necessarily, because what we normally are doing, we're given a carbon and we're trying to figure out what the structure is. In this case, I have a context for the product, okay. right? You don't have a product. You don't have a context for the for the products you're doing or for the molecules you're doing in lab, right? You're just given one. Here's a formula. Figure out what it is. But what I'm doing is so that I can talk about all, so that it makes sense for me to talk about spectroscopy in lecture as I'm relating it back to okay. our topic of the day, which is benzylic reaction. So it might, it might be useful. If I just gave you the structure of that molecule and the carbon, I'd expect to see seven unique carbons in that carbon. But this is the product, so we know there's seven carbons in it. <laughs> but if you're given a structure and you finally come up with a structure matched up with a carbon, if the carbon doesn't have that number of unique carbons, it is wrong. Your structure is wrong. So far, so good. Anybody really bored? It's fine. Uh, proton NMR. So this is how I'm going to get my pieces, and I'm going to put them together. It's from proton NMR. Now, in reality, if somebody does walk up and give me a molecule, and I've got to figure out what it is from scratch, there are methods that I can use with the carbon to tell whether that carbon's a CH3, CH2, CH, or it has no hydrogen bond. And that's pretty valuable information. But that's advanced. All right, take another class that I haven't taught for 10 years on that. Proton. I get three important pieces of information from every proton at a Number one, what do I get from the integration? And what is the integration? Well, in lab, when we've done GC, you, the area underneath the peak is proportional to the amount of product that we get, or the amount of that molecule. In NMR, the area underneath each set of peaks is proportional to the number of hydrogens that that peak represents, or that series of peaks represents. So what I would do is measure the area underneath each peak. I divide through by the smallest area, and I get a ratio. You will see either the plateau things that move across the screen, like I showed last week, and I'll show again. Or you'll get a thing that says 2H, 3H, 1H, 4H at the top of your peaks. They kind of cheated. They went. I will tell you that when you get your ester in lab, you will see those things that move across the page. 
and you will need to get a ruler and you will need to measure their height and divide through by the smallest by the smallest height of those which is kind of what we'll do with this one that I've got all right so that integration tells you whether it's a CH if there's one H it's a CH if there's two H's it's a CH2 if there's three H's it's a CH3 if there's six H's it's most likely two CH3's if it's four H's it might be two CH2's so I get my pieces from the integration that's what gives me the pieces all right so that's product B where did the product a proton go there it is it's before the outline so here's my product a proton NMR and it's got these little integration markers and so what I like to do is I like to basically measure blocks so it looks like this one has three blocks it looks like this one has one block ish it looks like this group has like one and a half blocks and then it looks like this one has one two three probably in the neighborhood of four blocks and so uh, I would translate that the 5H one H one H and six H and I'm not using the numbers to do that because if I actually put a ruler to the numbers they'd be pretty close all I'm doing is I know what the structure is so I'm just writing in the number of H's that go in with each one so the integrations would give me 5H, 1H, 1H, and 6H. I think those are the problems that you either have tackled or are tackling now. They give you H's at the top of the spectrum, right? Okay. So, but when you do your ester, you're going to have to measure it um, with a ruler. There is actually a function on the computer that will give you the area underneath here. But Apparently, we don't use that function. Right, so that's that's what we're looking for. So, hmm, 5H. What's this group? Yes, it does. Because you know what? There's one H there that I'm going to talk about later. That's the OH of the alcohol. So now I got 14. Okay. So that gives me the pieces. So I've got five carbon piece. I've got a CH, another CH, and the, and the six H's are probably two CH3s. Okay, but we'll come back to that. So now I got my pieces. Okay, the area underneath the peaks is proportional number of hydrogens. It tells you whether you use guys CH, CH2, CH3, coupling. Second thing, so coupling is then plus one rule, that's the number of neighbors. So if you have a singlet, a doublet, a triplet, a quartet, how many neighbors do you have if you're a singlet? Zero. Doublet, two, and three. Okay, so if you're a very clean group, meaning that there's only one group attached, you're only attached to one unique group, you'll get one of those peaks. Now what happens if you have what's called a multiplet, which is something that's bigger than four peaks? then you have more than 
three neighbors. And so you get these multiplets when you are a carbon, when you're a hydrogen that is in between two different groups. So if you're if you're a hydrogen attached to a carbon in between two different groups, like a CH3 on this side and a CH2 on that side, or a CH2 on this side and a CH2 on that side that aren't the same, what happens is you get split by both sets of groups. So if you got a CH3 on this side and a CH2 on that side, this side would give you a quartet, this side would give you a triplet. It's not that simple. It's actually a triplet of quartets or a quartet of triplets is the way it works. I don't have enough fingers to do that, so how about I do a double of the triplets? So here's a double of the triplets. That double of the triplets could be two triplets. It could be one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Could be five peaks. Could be one, two, three, four peaks. Could be, well, that'd be if they're the same. So you can have this whole variety of different shapes. The key thing is, that if you're in between two different groups and the, and the peaks are clean, meaning that they're symmetrical and you can see, the, see them top to bottom, that means that you've got one set of peaks in between two different groups. Now, if you have two sets of hydrogens that are overlapping, it gets ugly. It's really messy. And in that case, you've got two sets of multiplets maybe on top of each other. So if it's nice and symmetrical, it's just one group. But if it's messy, then you can have multiple hydrogens in that group. So you might end up with like four H's, but maybe you've got two CH's and a CH2. They're all overlapping. It would be really messy. If it was just a CH in between two other groups, it would be a nice, clean multiplet. Maybe six, maybe seven, maybe eight peaks. But it'll be nice and clean and nice and symmetric. Okay. That tells me the neighbors. Okay? It's a lot. I'm compacting how many weeks. Chemical shift's the last thing. So we got integration, gave us the pieces. The coupling tells us how to attach those pieces. And the chemical shift tells me what is the hydrogen that's attached to the carbon attached to. So there was another chart you were supposed to remember. I gave you a, well, I gave you a roll of detail. This one's pretty nice. But here's a simple proton, simple meaning if you don't have to memorize this and use it, this has probably everything on it you would need. So like carboxylic acids are between 11 and 12. Aldehydes are at 10. Hmm. That's an interesting peak. Um, peaks on uh, benzene rings are at 7 to 8. Hydrogens attached just to routine double bonds are between 5 and 6. Carbons attached, hydrogens attached to carbons attached to oxygen are around 4-ish. And then as you move to the right, your methyl groups are usually the ones that are to the, always to the right. So the chemical shift tells you where the hydrogen is in relationship to electron withdrawing groups like oxygen, like nitrogen, like halogens, like carbonyls, and like benzene rings. The closer the hydrogen is to an oxygen, the more it's shifted to the left. The farther it gets away, the more it is to the right. Okay. I would point the CH attached to O. I would attach. I would say that a CH attached to a carbonyl is about two-ish, between two and two and a half. Those are important ones because you encounter those a lot. For esters, you're going to encounter. This side of the ester is going to be about two. This side of the ester is going to be about four. And that helps you figure out where the structures are. So 
We've got integration pieces, coupling, how to put them together, and chemical shift kind of fits into both of those. All right. So now we got everything to put together. I'm going to throw out a couple of things. If you got an aromatic ring, first thing I always suggest with an aromatic ring is, and you know you have an aromatic ring because you've got protons in the seven part per million, you've got carbons in the 120 to 140. Integrate it. If you, in the integration, it'll tell you how many hydrogens are attached to the ring. If you had five hydrogens attached to the ring, you have one group. If you have four hydrogens attached to the ring, you got two groups attached. If you got three hydrogens attached to the ring, that means you got three groups attached. Let me go back to two groups. If you have two groups attached to the ring, they can be attached one, two, one, three, and one, four. One, two, and one, three, messy as hell. Very messy. One, four, you get two doublets. That's a useful thing to know. So when you see an aromatic ring peak with two doublets, it's one four di substitute. Alcohols and amines, they exchange, so they can be show up anywhere. If you add D2O to them, they disappear. They don't split the neighbors. Very rarely do they ever split neighbors. So we ignored them. That's why I ignored them before. Final structure. So when you come up with the final structure, everything has to be consistent. If you predict from your structure that something's a singlet and you don't have any singlets, you are wrong. So if it doesn't match up, chances are you're wrong. Benzene ring. So there's our structure. Benzene ring, CH, CH, two CH3s. Now you got to put it together with the OH. And that'll tell you what the product of A was. So you got to fit it together so that those couplings and the chemical shifts make sense. Last thing, so I got a CH at 5. What's that CH attached to? All right, we'll finish. Let's, if you want to be overly ambitious and try this for Friday, we'll go. Then you can tell me what the structure is. Otherwise, I'll just finish this up in about five, ten minutes on Friday. All right, I'll take your take-home quizzes. And if you have any, it, since I covered this stuff in lecture, if you have any questions about spectroscopy, about lecture, you can come and ask me. Okay. I have a quick question, and probably tomorrow as well, but how are you getting the three blocks in like 5H? Like, I don't I did, I, you know, the problem with the, blo the blocks, the problem with the blocks, the way that this predicts it,